Namaste. Good morning. Today, I would like to touch upon three questions that I have received briefly. And then we can open the floor up to anyone who would like to share something or ask something. The first question was sent by parents. And their question was, with the understanding of Advaita, how would parenting be different? And the answer is quite simple. The parents will do precisely that which they think and feel they should do in terms of parenting. There is no change in that perspective simply because this teaching does not say do this and don't do that and so on. There is no change in that approach. But now with the understanding the parents have that whatever they may do as a parent is limited by their conditioning and nature. When this understanding is there, that at the end of the day, as a parent, I'm operating on the basis of my conditioning. Something very beautiful happens. A sense of relaxation and release comes into the picture. For now, the parent will not force their view on the child beyond a point. There will be a sense of freedom in the approach. And my spiritual guide would say, this happens because now the parents know that ultimately, their child has its own destiny. When this innate understanding is there in the parenting process, that each child comes with their own blueprint, their own destiny, they may not see the way we see things, do the way we do things, then they are allowing the child freedom to be more expressive. This is the only difference and yet a big difference. And I keep saying that ultimately, peace of mind in daily living becomes paramount. So we start knowing what actions of ours, words, and so on, are disturbing our peace of mind as well as another's peace of mind. And it's like a recalibration.
not just in the parent child relationship in all relationships when the dial is set to peace of mind we find our approach our attitude to life as ramesh ji would say undergoes a change the second question was on a situation where there are siblings who are now all in their 70s and early 80s and suddenly there is discord over a property matter and cases have been filed in the autumn of life this has happened someone wants the entire property not willing to share it with their siblings wants the inheritance of the property to go to only their children so this has led to an extremely stressful situation something a person really doesn't need when they are 80 years old so the question was that we have to fight in the courts to try and protect our interest and a peace of mind has been blown to smithereens and once again how does the teaching of advaita help in this scenario so the teaching of advaita brings in only an understanding you see sometimes people have a guru or a lineage they belong to where they take their mundane problems and in the traditional hindu setting for example a guru would suggest a certain upay a remedy could be mantras could be going to a certain temples whatever it be that is that path this is the path of gyan yoga the path of understanding so how does a person who is in this situation where their sibling has placed a case on them because he or she wants the entire property how do they deal with it so what happens here is once again if one has to go to court one goes to court in fact one has been taken to court so one has to defend oneself and state one's point of view it is something which has come one's way unasked and as maharaj said what comes unasked is what is meant for you pleasure or pain in this case a very painful situation pain arises 
that how could my siblings do this to me at this age? It's very valid. But the man or woman of understanding knows this has happened because it was meant to happen, else it would not have happened. That is the first understanding. An acceptance of what is, which does not mean to reiterate that pain won't arise. We are human beings. Immense pain will arise. But with this understanding that everyone has their point of view and obviously my sibling has a very specific point of view in this case that the property should be theirs. No matter how right or wrong, this is their point of view. All I can do is offer my point of view. If the other person is not willing to listen, so be it. I cannot force my point of view on the other. If the doors are closed, the matter ends there. So now what happens with the understanding that everyone is acting on their genetics and conditioning, which is their inherent nature, and everyone does what they think and feel they should do, this action has happened. So now my battle is no longer trained on this individual, this specific sibling who has done this to me. Now my battle is to be fought with objectivity in the courtroom and I am supposed to do my best. See which lawyer resonates with me the most. Explain my situation, my case. And then know, as it is said in the Bhagavad Gita, the effort is ours, the results have never been in our control. We may be right, but that does not guarantee the outcome. When we live with this understanding that no matter what the effort, no matter who is right and who is wrong, the outcome is not in one's control. This means we have an innate acceptance of the will of God, even though we may not like it. It is not about liking the will of God. It is knowing and accepting that this does not make sense. I didn't do anything. I should have got the property, but for some reason the case went against me. We tried our best. We had all the proper documents, the reasons, yet it didn't go in our favor. These things happen. But now what has happened is the pain which arises is not directed on the principles of doership. He or she did this to me, so I hate them. And I will hate them till my last breath. That does not happen with this understanding. I may choose not to associate with, not to talk with someone simply because I have that preference. This understanding does not mean I have to hug and love everyone who has done things to me, so to speak. It depends on my nature. If my nature is, look, I'm at the fag end of my life, I might as well forgive and forget then so be it. There is no particular way to behave. But when it is seen that the hand of God is behind every event that transpires in our life, and as Shirdi Sai Baba would say, 
All relationships, especially the tumultuous ones, are based on Vinanubandhan. We don't know how it works. We simply don't have the capacity to see the larger picture. And then this brings us to a most beautiful sentence uttered by Joel Goldsmith. Yours becomes a peace be still to the errors of the world. Yours becomes a peace be still to the errors of the world. What does this mean? How do we understand the statement? In this particular scenario, it is clear if I am at the receiving end, the error of the world is that this case was put upon me by my sibling to take away my share of the property. So according to me, this is an error. But now I know, deep down, this happened because it was meant to happen. I know deep down, the other is not the doer of their actions. And I know deep down, the outcome is not in my control. I know deep down that my view of the conflict is based on my perspective, the limitations of my views, which in turn are based on my genetics and conditioning. So the understanding dawns that the error of the world in this case is a perception. It must be based on the way I as an individual see it. Yet now I know it is based on my individual perspective. The judge may have a different perspective. So what happens? I think about my decades old relationship with my siblings and pain may arise. But that pain does not get transformed to hatred and malice. I am free of that. Or as my teacher would say, Sometimes hate arises in the moment. How could you have done that? And it's gone. Because the understanding gets superimposed, so to speak. Thy will be done. So someone recently said to me that now when things happen in their lives, if someone says something at the dinner table which is contrary to their point of view, the internal dialogue becomes, so be it. Rather than a knee-jerk reaction to defend oneself and project one's view over the other. So be it. Or, as he said to me, if so be it doesn't arise, then what arises is, is it so? Is it so?
But the problem is the ego does not like the end of conflict. Because when there is conflict, it has an identity. Now it knows who I am. I am in conflict because this is me. This is my story. This is my point of view, which I am identified with. So, the possibility of the end of conflict is quite scary for the ego. Quite scary. If you find yourself engaged in incessant arguments and conflict in general, this needs to be understood. What am I defending? What precisely am I defending? Who am I defending? A bundle of judgments and opinions and so on and so forth based on my conditioning from day one. I am defending that because that is me. That is the burden of memory. And as we grow older, we stack up more and more of the burden of memory, which draws us into our now very long past. How many stories do I keep repeating in my mind of the past? All my setbacks, my failures, what people did to me. Trying to get sympathy from the person I'm talking to. Then one sees with the light of knowledge the game the ego plays. That is why Siddharameshwar Maharaj said, Maya is me. Which simply put means Maya is me and my story. Maya is me versus the other. Maya is this game of duality which got converted, to use my teacher's words, to dualism, where the basic polarities of me and the other in life became me versus the other. Separation. So do I see generally when I interact with others, what comes forth first? All their flaws? All their shortcomings? Or do I see and know that everyone is acting out their script based on what the divine planned for them? And the same light of consciousness which animates me, animates them. Especially the ones I don't like and don't get along with.
someone sent me this quotation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama this morning. When you talk, you are only repeating what you already know. But if you listen, you may learn something new. When I talk, I am talking based on what I have acquired in the past. My worldview, my nature, my conditioning, the way I see things, that is the known. How much am I lost in stories? So much so that I am unable to listen to what the other is saying and feel them. I am always eager to interject, to step into the conversation. Yes, but. You see, because in listening, there is no doership. In listening, I am not doing listening. Lastly, someone sent me a mail on the subject of feeling lonely. Suffering, feeling lonely. And that person said that I have Friends who are single, who are very happy with their lives. Happy being alone. Now you see, this is the first problem we create for ourselves. Why am I like that if my friend can be like that? Comparing and therefore judging. Some people by nature may feel lonely, others may not. That is the first step. Now, in psychology, they say man is a social being, loves being with other people. There is nothing wrong with that. This person was feeling guilty. What is wrong with me that I am feeling so bad? about this feeling of loneliness. It is an expression of an emotion. When not judged, I am not creating more suffering for myself. Then the question arises, what can I do about it? Can I do anything about it? And if so, what? And this I have mentioned before in some talks. Some very beautiful input given by my teacher. That if you are feeling lonely and you don't have many friends, why, now, why not find out others? who are equally lonely and spend time with them. So this lady asked my teacher, what does that mean? How can I find out who else is lonely? And he said, it's very simple. For example, just one example, go to an orphanage. Those children don't have any parents. Spend time with them. 
take gifts for them, make them happy. And for that period of time, they won't feel lonely, you won't feel lonely. Of course, if one is inclined to do that. But you see, this is quite important. What happens in this scenario? The spotlight which is on me and my feeling of loneliness is now turned around to the other. This obsession with me and I am feeling lonely is now turned around and therefore this is the process of being unselfed because now I am no longer thinking of my loneliness. Efforts are on for the other. And this is a very beautiful process, the process of being unselfed. When I find I am thinking more about others, how they feel, what they say, what is it based on, would I think the same if I was in their shoes? I am being unselfed. This truly represents the turning of the wheel. Now, in some religions, donation is a big thing to give a certain percentage of one's earnings. Apart from the moral responsibility, let's say, what is happening? That same trigger is being applied. That in this case, this money is not for me. It is for the other. Being unselfed and being happy to enhance the life of the other. Not to win brownie points from God. So one finds that on this path, one becomes more and more generous, not just with money, that's just one material aspect. One can become generous with one's time, where it is valued. One finds one is giving in so many ways and not taking all the time. That is why in one Tibetan course I had studied, it said, your only true possessions are those you give away. Those on this path, on any spiritual path, Find these aspects and dimensions of life, personality, opening up. Of course, it tends to take oneself away from the mundane and the material because it is seen as being so overvalued, so transient, unreal disappearing like thin mist, here today, gone tomorrow. So the interest in the mundane starts diminishing.
All right. So if anyone has anything to share, they can put up their, raise their hands and I will put them on. Yes, Franco. Hi, Gautam. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Okay, I have a question about second male. Uh, let's say if someone is timid by nature and does not want to go to courts and fight with these things, uh, this side can even be in a state of acceptance and still will be judged by family or society uh, with questions why you are not fighting, why you, all, you are always losing even without trying to fight, how you are going to survive in this world. So how, what is the best attitude to these complaints, outside complaints? R Ranko, your question reminds me of me. <laughs> yeah. You see, if it is not one's nature and you are in pain because you have to go to court, psychological pain, because it's not me, I can't do it. I simply can't do it. I know it's the right thing to do. I know it makes sense. I know I need the money. But I can't do it. Then what happens? What others may say, you're being a fool, hurts me. So be it. Am I prepared to face the consequences of not going to court? I have to ask myself. And if the answer is very clear, I do not have the temperament, the mental capacity, the emotions. I'm not strong-willed. I can't do it. So be it. Because as Joel Goldsmith said, do not think. Of course, I'm now paraphrasing his words. Do not think that there is only the court of man. There is the court of God. The larger picture, that which we can't see. The realm of the unknown. What is transpiring, which we are unable to comprehend. So one takes solace in that. I know my limits. I know what I can do and I can't do. I know it simply does not make sense not going to court. Does not make sense to the logical left brain thinking mind. Everyone means well by telling me you must go to court. I can't do it. I accept the outcome of this decision could be painful. And I hope that God gives me the strength to deal with it. So am I bold enough to take this step back? Only God knows. But there is one thing very comforting if I do take the step back. That this could only be God's will. Yeah, and I'm also timid in nature and funny thing, I work in court. <laughs> so, <laughs> but from this perspective, when I have to decide about something, it is not very difficult for me. I do it yes. for all my life. But when I'm in position to sue somebody and to fight with somebody, it is something totally different. That is life. That is very beautiful. This is actually the diversity of being. 
but it also points to something very important that I know myself, I know my innate nature. You see, some people uh, being timid are easily influenced by others. And then they end up doing that which in their heart they don't want to do and they continue suffering that. Ranko, they continue suffering being someone who they are not. And that itself is too much doership. Yeah, I was like that before, but I started to learn how to put my boundaries and stuff like that and kind of just my task in this life to put boundaries, to learn about boundaries. And it's so easier when you know to do how to do that. The only task as such is to be at peace. Okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's really not a task because that would again be too much work. But, yeah. but it happens. It happens. It happens. It really happens. It really happens. And you see, the main point is, will my action, my so-called action, lead to the diminishing of psychological suffering. And if the answer is yes, then very objectively I see what about the physical suffering in terms of less money, etc., whatever, living a decent life. If I find that my head will still be above the water, I take the decision. And I'm ready to face the outcome. I'm ready to be judged by society, including my friends, my family. But I will sleep at night, Ranko. I will sleep at night. Yeah, that answers the question. All right. Thank you. Yes, Hina. Hello, Gautam. Namaste. Namaste. Uh, actually, uh, this one question I have been asking myself since really long time. Uh, since a year, I have been listening to your lectures and I went to Ramna Mahashri's ashram. And Ramna Mahashri, uh, in, and I was reading a book, Silence of the Heart, that time. And then when I went there to the ashram, he introduced me to, the, to silence. And Rupert always tells that, like, you know, consciousness, uh, contemplating on consciousness is the highest meditation. And that time I went to Ramna Mahashri Ashram and then I realized that just being quiet, closing my eyes, being quiet and just feeling unlimited is the thing, just witnessing it was my, is my meditation basically. But then when I'm a housewife, during my day to day life, I am just following not my will or Lord dying be done. That is yours and accepting everything. And if I react also, it's okay. It wasn't my will. I, I'm just not the doer. It just happened. So it gives me peace. But since I was reading before, uh, I was listening to Rupert, Ekhar Toll, and then you, sometimes I get very hassled that like, you know, okay, fine. In my life, I have accepted everything. And I don't stopped praying because you said I should be in a position where I shouldn't be praying for myself. It's just... Any tension, any depression, I tell, okay, not my will, oh Lord, dying be done. And I'm silent. I'm quiet. I'm happy. But then that uh, just to know possibly this is not enough. I have to read something more. I have to do something more. That hassles me. So do I really need to know more than like, do I need to know myself more and more and more? Or just knowing that it's just happening. You are not the doer. Accept. That is enough. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Quite beautiful uh, what you shared, Hina. Thank you, you see, uh, to know yourself more and more and more and more, there'll be no end to that self. Yes. Yeah. 
because knowledge with a lower case k is unending <laughs> you have told that in that one uh, lecture of yours that there is no limit that you can know yourself you should yes. just stop yeah but before i go on i would like to uh, clarify one very important misconception to say that when i react i know even that is god's will is fine but if i am truly focused on finding my peace i will reflect on the fact that whether my reactions are based on doership or not you see because this is not a license to keep reacting because it is god's will uh -huh. it has to be understood maybe like my teacher would say at the end of the day i sit back with a cup of coffee look at the events of the day and come to the understanding that any action which happened was not the other's action nor mine so when the sense of doership gets diminished when i have this innate understanding that whoever i meet in the day are not the doers of their actions i will also find a change in my reaction otherwise i'll be playing out the old script till kingdom comes saying that i'm not the doer no help because i'm not more and more at peace this must be clarified for everyone that there is bound to be a change in reaction if the teaching is going deeper yes we keep reacting based on old patterns and old conditioning which are hardwired into us no doubt about it and we say oh there we go again but that mm -hmm. understanding cuts off the involvement that i could not help that reaction but this does not mean that going forward i will continue playing the tennis match with others all the time so what do i find that more and more my reaction is not as sharp as it could have been when it was based on doership and i start finding that i am now more and more responding rather than reacting to people then i know mm -hmm. you see the silence heena mm -hmm. is of no use if i am sitting in front of shri ramana maharshi samadhi for half an hour as shri aurobindo said oh meditation is fine but what about the rest of the day what about while you are at work while you are housewife while you are in the office dealing with people dealing with situations that is so to speak an external sadhana there is no point enjoying half an hour of deep silent meditation and my daily living is full of conflict hatred malice jealousy envy pride arrogance guilt shame and so on so it is very important to reflect on the day on my relationships not only with people in the day on what transpired in the day and then i find that when my view of the day and what happened is no longer based on the old concept of doership and attributing actions to individuals this silence which i touched upon in meditation becomes the layer the underlying layer of my day i find i start going back into that silence more and more during the course of the day why because my thinking mind is no longer engaged in what if scenarios and what should be scenarios my thinking mind is in what is and when that space is created when the garbage of the thinking mind is cleared out during the course of the day i am tapping into that silence which is always ever present all it needs for recognition is that my external chatter and the chatter of my thinking mind is quieted down yes actually all this is happening like you know all this is happening 
I am quiet. I am just silent with people. No more. I mean, like very, very less conflicts. Uh, no more arguments because I feel possibly he is also what you have said. Like you know, he is a product of his genes and his uh, environment that he has been brought up or she has been brought up. So no conflict, just acceptance for everything. It's just acceptance going on. It's my mind is getting silent and silent and silent. The only thing that bothers me is. possibly i have to do more i have to sit in meditation or i have to read more or uh, somebody i don't know who's who has said whenever you you're depressed or something just start reading something yes so my mind just doesn't go anywhere only thing is i'm bothered i i won't be able to reach where i have though i feel okay i am that again i am that but the confusion continuously bothers me and i don't know what you see hina that is very natural because the ego knows only how to do and not how to be so it wants to do more in order to be more do you understand the ego is hardwired into doing 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 so that i can get more and more peace of mind whereas the peace of mind is the absence of the ego doing anything so what you are saying is a natural process the ego will go through what you see because when it when the peace has been tasted silence has been tasted you want to get to it faster so the ego thinks i can keep doing things to get to it fa- faster and faster and faster very natural process it would be foolish for me to tell you that oh how can you do that and all this is what the ego does but what has happened is something very beautiful you see when one has dipped one's toe in the waters of silence it is that which takes over so hina may do and think all she wants to read more do this is irrelevant in the larger picture why because the reset has happened mm-hmm. the reset has happened that there is a silence which i truly dived into now that silence has to be allowed the space to emerge during the course of the day so even if hina cannot help doing at the back of her mind is this awareness all i'm doing is doing that's all i can do that's what i've been conditioned to but everything that happens going forward in day this background will automatically automatically start coming to the fore have no doubt about it you know have no doubt about it okay okay just one more question can i ask yes a uh, third thing that you just told that like you know when you're feeling lonely you can always go to orphanage or somewhere but uh, somehow i felt that i don't know i'm i i might be wrong that whatever i if i'm feeling lonely i should just sit with it because possibly it's there since my like no since ages or in my genes or whatever so rather than running away from it i should be there just sit with it it might be there till i die or it might not be just accept it because i'm not doing it just came to me i never wanted to have that loneliness right so uh, we should just sit with it or uh, find some options to get away with it see hina if you can sit with it it's most beautiful but very many people are afraid to sit with it and it is for them as i said as my teacher gave this very specific example of a lady who was a model in her younger years who loved attention and the world would look at her when she would cross the streets and now the world was no longer looking at her mm-hmm. so to sit with it was causing immense pain and suffering and therefore he suggested to do an action which took away the mind from itself and its loneliness and went outwards if you can sit with it and ask yourself where does this feeling of loneliness arise what do i feel when i'm lonely that of course is a most beautiful inquiry self investigation most beautiful but if it is your nature 
someone else's nature may not be that. Yeah. So if your it's nature is that, yes, of course, different strokes for different folks. <laughs> this is not a one size fits all teaching that would be actually a form of violence. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. And I please, I really request you to have this online sessions every Sunday so that we can also have that Sunday church that you had. Thank please, you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Namaste. God bless. Okay. Yes, sir, Gerald. Good morning, Gautam. Uh, thank you so much for uh, doing these Zoom sessions. It's It's wonderful. Um, I'd like to come back to Ronco's point, um, if I may, because as I was listening to what you described, I had a similar reaction to his, only slightly different. And I think you touched upon it when you responded to him, but I don't think I heard what I actually was thinking, which was the reaction to being brought to court didn't have to be one where you fight or one where you were timid about fighting, but simply the acceptance of, well, okay, this is what's supposed to happen. And you just let it happen with the understanding that you don't know what's going to happen, you know, after that. Isn't that a possibility? Yes, but are you referring to Ranko's case or the case before that of the siblings I was talking about? Well, well, the siblings, but but isn't that the same case that, that Ranko was talking about? Not really, because in the siblings case, the the eldest sibling is not a timid personality. She will go to court and fight. In Ranko's case, his issue is while he his work is in the courtrooms, his innate nature itself is of being timid. I'm I'm sorry. I meant I meant the case. So let's say we had two siblings, and one brought the other one to court. The other one who is being brought to court could just say, "Okay, you can have the land. We don't need to do this," and of just course. accept. It. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But that if that person relies on that land for income or finance, then there's a problem. That person can still say that I'm willing to even let that go. Mm -hmm. You see, that is the decision to be made. But that is, right. I mean, you see, uh, Gerald, that is actually in placing one's entire trust on the will of God. Mm -hmm. What I have described is very rare. A sage with the highest understanding may or may not act like that. We don't know because he would be equally comfortable in court as well as out of it. We don't know which way he will swing. That is why when someone asked Nisardatta Maharaj that if I pulled out a knife and came at you right now, what would you do? And his answer was, I don't know. Whatever arises in the moment will arise. So the person who is able to have the God-given strength of saying that, I don't want to fight this case, no matter what the cost is at peace. The game is up. No matter what the cost, I don't have the temerity to fight this case. I don't even want to fight it. Let it all go to my sibling. I will figure out life and life will figure out its plan to me. That person has reached the deepest levels of peace. Thank you. The sage may still fight. I don't know if there's a way to share this, but there are two very beautiful transcripts. One is when Ramanam Harshi was taken to court and the dialogue between him and the judge and the other is when Shirdi Sai Baba was taken to court. So such masters were taken to court 
if there is a way to share this dialogue, I will get our team to work on it and share it with you all on email because it's very beautiful. And it shows that the quality of being sthir, stillness, is what allows events to take place the way they are meant to. The way they are meant to. And it is actually a very beautiful point you raised because even this thought of having the option to let it all go does not come to everyone. Does not come to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Monica. Hi. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, hi. Thank you, Gautam. Thank you so much. This is my first live session with you. And uh, my heartfelt gratitude, firstly, I've been listening to you and Ameshi's teachings for a long time now. And um, just big, big thank you. The teaching has made, like, calmed me down so much over the period of last few years. It's amazing. So I just wanted to share a little bit about my journey. It was uh, 2004 or maybe earlier. But it started with the whole chanting movement, you know, the bhakti traditions in Vrindavan. And uh, I've been associated uh, with the Hariji temple and with this corn for a short while. And, uh, but this whole Advaita and, and uh, specifically like peace and daily living that came to me only a few years back. So now the whole thing happens in the head at times that, oh, the interest here is started becoming more and I'm gravitating here more. And uh, somehow I'm finding like how it in the bhakti traditions, it is like you need to visualize and uh, it's mostly after death, you know, the next life and things like that. So, so, and here it is uh, something like practical, like day to day living. And um, so can you share something about this transition at times it I feel guilty maybe the interest that how it was there it's not happening now and uh, though I have a guru like this I've been uh, I've got Diksha in a mantra uh, in Vrindavan now I do my uh, uh, routine like the chanting routine and all that but the interest here is becoming more and there less so is there a way I can balance it out or I can do something about this feeling of guilt at times. So what do you, if you can just share something. Oh, sure. I might share a perspective which will, which could surprise you or maybe not since you're on the path. Okay. And I keep saying it. I've written about it in a book which will be forthcoming of my experiences. Monica, in fact, this is a deepening of bhakti. Make no mistake. Oh. It is not different. You see, it's very simple. How is jnana, how is the path of knowledge? A deepening of the path of bhakti sounds like a big contradiction. What is Advaita? Showing you to see the one in the many. The one yes. consciousness speaking to someone, listening through someone else. When I accept that everyone is an instrument of God, designed and made precisely the way God made them, then isn't that the ultimate living bhakti? Absolutely. Isn't Absolutely. that what Krishna consciousness is about? Rather than yeah. if I'm just at a certain level of doing mantra jap and, you know, worshipping, let's say, a murti of any of Krishna, let's use an example. Isn't this 
a deeper form of worshipping Krishna. As yeah. Goldsmith would say, when the time comes, when your relationships are harmonious by and by, then your relationships are no longer with people, but with God. Because God made yeah. everyone. Isn't that the same path you are on, just a deeper version of it? Where the manifest world, the Sagun Brahman, not just the Nirgun formless consciousness of Advaita, but Nirgun Sagun, Consciousness without form, consciousness with form. Aren't both being worshipped if I am able to live this understanding through my relationships? Absolutely. So in fact, it is a deepening of your journey. It is a lived Thank experience of bhakti. Thank you so much. That, that really is very relieving. And I do think like this. But when you know, if anyone has gone to uh, Rindavan or um, associated with the Bhakti movement uh, saints, then when you go there, they negate, they say, no, you don't have to go anywhere. There's the, don't go on the Gyan, mark. You bhatak jaoge, the dimaag kharaab ho jayega, and uh, pareshan ho jaoge, be here, you know. So I get these kind of advices and then I'm in such a fix. <laughs> see, see, <laughs> so I completely God. understand. Everyone does what they think and feel they should do, including yeah. them and including you. Ultimately, if it is your destiny to go on to another path, it is God's will. If it is your destiny not to go on to the other path, it is God's will. If it is your destiny to have the best of both, it is God's will. So, you see, it is the ego which is racked with guilt because it thinks I am, the, I am doing this. Mm -hmm. yeah, I am not doing it. Where is the question of guilt? God has shown me another dimension of life which is leading to harmonious relationships with people and a peaceful disposition through the day. This can only yeah. happen if it is God's will. And more importantly, this path will not tell you not to go anywhere else. Correct. Because it, it, it would be foolish to assume it could control God's will. You know, yeah. my teacher did not give a damn who went where and came from where. It was irrelevant. He had... <laughs> A divine job to do sitting in that rocking chair. Yeah. I from when he was 83 till he was 92. And that is yeah. all that happened. This yeah. teaching yeah. will not try to pull the reins in, make you stay with it. Because the innate understanding is everyone will go where they are meant to. If they are not meant yeah. to go elsewhere, they will stay. If they are meant to go elsewhere, they will go. So you needn't worry if you feel you'll be held back in some time in future on this, there will be no guilt. <laughs> I assure you. <laughs> okay, great, great. Thank you so much. One last thing I wanted to uh, just share with you. Uh, in your last talks with at Pune, uh, like I think a couple of months back, uh, my friend had gone there and I had sent my regards to you through her. So that was Sophia. I don't know whether you remember her or not. I'm in UK and I'm looking forward for you. You told her that you would be coming here. So I'm looking forward for you to come here. And yes, I have... would love to come there. It's been uh, my last trip to the UK was 2019. So I look On... forward to okay. that. Okay. Great, great, great. Thank you so much, Gautam. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. I think we have time for just one more question <clears throat> and then we'll uh, call it a day. Yes, Vishwas. Pranam, sir. Thank you so much for this talk. This is my first time listening to you live, and it's been an incredible experience. Thank you. Um, I am on no such uh, particular path, but uh, this is my most uh, personal uh, thing of interest. 
this this whole path of figuring out who i really am and uh, in 2019 towards the end of the year i experienced i had an experience where i felt that i felt so much love in my heart where i felt that where it started pouring out and it healed a lot of my relationships just by within just just through that experience with my parents and with my friends and i realized that that everything that's happened to me until that point was meant to happen to 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 bring me to that point of realization and since then where i stand today today i'm in a place where that experience is in the past and it holds a very strong place in my memory and i miss it and the longing for who i was in those months and what i felt in that time has left a lot of pain in me and i am in a place of lovely loneliness which through the last couple of months i've uh, started to sort of enjoy and accept but one thing that started happening is it's sort of taking a toll on my body i feel much older i feel uh, way less energy than i used to have at times and my when i asked this before asking you i asked myself that what's happening with you and the answer that i got from deep within was that i'm going through a phase of churning and on the other side of it when i reach things will be much easier and something needs to happen which is beyond my understanding which i am going through so so far i have not asked anyone about what's really happening because i didn't have the fortune of being with someone where i felt you know i should ask this so today i am i am keeping this question in front of you you see vishwas your question is uh... has happened to many people on this path you know they have been given an experience a heart based experience which has landed them in bliss for maybe a week or two or whatever it may be but then what has happened when that experience has gone the old patterns the old conditioning come back to the fore and then that experience is missed and the yearning is can i have that again because it was so beautiful when it lasted that experience my teacher would call a free sample from god now the ego wants it and that wanting creates further suffering the ego knows it had nothing to do with that first experience it was purely an act of divine grace now it wants that it is very beautiful because it knows where it feels at home it is pointing towards that but because it is the nature of the ego to keep wanting acquiring it wants to acquire that which was not its doing in the first place so where does that leave us with only one thing after all your name is vishwas it means trust i have to trust that which gave me that experience to do the rest if i take it upon myself i suffer i have to trust that my glass is not half empty it is half full if god was gracious enough to give me that experience which many have not had why am i thinking he's going to leave me here if i find that there is in the body exhaustion or whatever qualities are there i just have to ask myself it could be because my mind is not at peace or it could just be an energetic process this the answer only you will know 
like some people, when their mind is not at peace, they have sleepless nights. Sleepless nights take a toll on their body. Now, if you ask yourself in honesty, am I generally at peace? Then perhaps it is a process, a phase of churning as you use the word. But if you find that, no, I have been thinking a lot, a lot of turmoil in my mind about this, then it is a result of that which is taking a toll on the body. Whatever it is, that trust, that vishwas, please don't lose it. That is all. I, it, in, instead of losing it, I feel it just keeps getting stronger because that longing just keeps pulling me to, to people like you where I find the answers to questions that I didn't even know I had. That's beautiful. And uh, yes, there is. A, the, the thing is, since that experience, the... The truth of suffering is just, I can't look away from it anymore. You know, I used to have a lot of hobbies and things to do where, you know, I could keep myself engaged. But the, the deeper I'm getting into the experience of, of my truth, just that first thing that the Buddha said that all life is suffering, I can't, it's just so... It's so true all the time in front of me that I'm in a phase where I'm, it's too much for me to accept sometimes. Even when I meet people or I talk to them and, you know, like, like the mundane of every day, it's, it's for me, like it's, so that's where I, I really am when I, when I meet someone or talk to them, you know, like I see my suffering and their suffering and it's right there in front of me. And sometimes it's overwhelming. Yes, so Vishwas, that is a problem. Because after all, the Buddha said, Samsara is Dukha, no doubt. Nirvana is Shanti, no doubt. But they are not two. The world is suffering, Nirvana is peace. But they are not two, which means peace is to be found through the suffering. And okay. I would be very happy to carry this conversation on to the next Zoom because we are out of time now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I think uh, it's a beautiful process, no matter how painful, because you see, you have been placed now in a certain direction. Yes. That self is a gift from God. It is a gift. It is a God-given gift. Yes, sir. I would like to just now uh, share two minutes with everyone on, uh, I'll have to change the view. Before that, I'm just going to try. I hope I don't cut myself off because I'm quite useless with these things to share a very beautiful quotation. Lord Goraknath's teachings on renunciation. I hope everyone can see me because I've closed the screen. Anyway, I'll take a chance. Once a householder came to pay his respects to Lord Goraknath with folded hands. And he said, O oh, respected one, your sacrifice is great for you have given up the whole world for God. Goraknath replied with folded hands, O respected one, your sacrifice is greater than mine, for you have given up the infinite God for this finite world.
Thank you.